Uh, I can refer to him as the inventor of drones or the creator of drones or the grandfather of drones um, and other things. He wrote a great book, Wired uh, by War, War by Wire. The Art of Intelligence. Oh, The Art of Intelligence. Uh, and Shelby Coffey, who is the uh, creator of the museum. <laughs> a spoke in a giant wheel. Uh, but thank you all so much for coming. We're always enormously uh, honored to have the Washington Ideas Festival here. Um, in the world of spies, Ambassador Henry Crumpton is a legend. And uh, after 24 years in the CIA clandestine services, he became a little more public by helping then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice uh, coordinate the counterterrorism efforts around the world. He went even more public this past year uh, with a book, a very well-received and well-reviewed book, on the art of intelligence. And behind those uh, emerging from the world of shadows was a driving desire and ambition to educate American policymakers and especially the American public about the needs and uses of intelligence in our hyper-connected world of asymmetrical threats. But before that, he created his signal legend in Afghanistan where he took roughly 110 CIA officers and 400 plus special operations forces to overthrow the Taliban, mission accomplished, really, in a few very long weeks. So we'd like to start there, Mr. Ambassador, and say, how did you get that mission, and how did you come up with that plan? Shelby, thanks uh, uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it was an intelligence mission, first and foremost, if we look at Afghanistan. And we deployed the first teams uh, into Afghanistan in September of uh, 1999. So for two years, we had developed networks and built trusted alliances with our Afghan allies and prospective allies. And so we had a two year, uh, two years of hard work building this, this network and building these alliances. So when 9-11 happened, we knew who we could depend upon mm -hmm. and we knew who we could go to. So it wasn't only collecting intelligence against Al Qaeda and the enemy, but also about erstwhile allies and, and really mapping the human terrain. Along that path, there had been the hunt for Osama bin Laden and the first idea for drones came in and then armed drones. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about that and why you and your team pushed for that. It was really um, a product of great frustration because we had these human sources, these networks in Afghanistan, reporting on bin Laden and on his whereabouts. And we, in turn, were passing this on to the policymakers in the White House and, and the, the Department of Defense. But we could not get the authorities or the resources to go and engage with lethal force against bin Laden. This was pre-9-11. Mm -hmm. And they said, we need a greater verification. So we looked at all types of uh, technical solutions. We looked at balloons, long-range optics, and finally decided on, on the drone, the, the Predator drone. And then we, sure enough, driven by our human sources on the ground, we found bin Laden. A very clear video. We knew exactly where he was, Tarnak Farms near Kandahar. And then we reported the intelligence. And the response was, well, the cruise missiles will take several hours. Where is he going to be several hours from now? Mm. And mm. at that point, we said, OK, we'll have to do it ourselves. So can we attach Hellfire missiles to a drone. And that's what compelled the CIA to put this program together. And when 9-11 transpired, that's why the CIA had armed drones in theater. As you look back on it now, the drone warfare has increased probably well beyond what you foresaw mm -hmm. at that time. On balance, the right thing. On balance, a questionable thing. How do you weigh that? As any tool, any weapon, it depends on how you employ it. It's mm -hmm. exceedingly precise, a very small warhead, can go through a window. It's a lot better than dropping a 500-pound bomb. It's a lot safer than putting troops on the ground. Mm -hmm. But what concerns me most today is the over-reliance or potential over-reliance on this technology, particularly in the absence of human sources. 
in, in September of, of 2001, we had more than 100 sources in every province of Afghanistan scattered throughout the country. We only had two drones, one armed, one unarmed. Um, the balance today, I'm sure, is a lot different. You cannot allow technology to undermine those human relationships, those human networks. When, uh, when you look now at the Afghanistan war, what echoes from especially those early days as the Afghans spoke to you mm -hmm. and what, in, given that a lot of the American public just wants to head for the exits as soon, mm -hmm. what should we be weighing as we think about it? The question uh, that resonated most deeply with me in, in the fall of 01 when I was in Afghanistan talking to our Afghan allies, they asked me this with a great deal of passion, concern, a very simple question. Are you going to stay this time? Remembering what we had told them during the Soviet occupation, that we would help them rebuild their country after the Soviets left, of course, that was not the case. We lied to them. They remember that. And so today they're still asking that, that same question. When you decided to come out from behind the shadows uh, and help Secretary Rice, you wrote the book, you helped uh, Jennifer Sims uh, write a book on transforming U.S. intelligence. Mm -hmm. One of the things that struck me was your thought that the American public really needs to know more. On the one hand, we love our James Bond movies. We like to see you as figures of, of mystery and romance. And uh, on the other hand, if anything goes wrong, why didn't you know that? Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that we should know? And first, if you would tell people how President Bush uh, reacted when he saw you coming in with Condoleezza Rice and saw that you were coming out. Uh, what was that statement? <laughs> yes, uh, I had met President Bush, of course, right after 9-11 and, and briefed him and his team throughout that, that year from 01 to 02. And um, he treated me with great respect and, and during that year. But later on when I was at State, he walked in and he saw me there and he turned to Secretary Rice and he said, the throat slitter as a diplomat, how, how is that working? <laughs> uh, and, and, An interesting uh, question from the top. <laughs> and, and Secretary Rice, uh, who's a terrific boss, said, it's, it's working out fine, Mr. President. <laughs> um, but your earlier question of, of why is intelligence important? Yeah. Why do I what think do need to know? the American public and our allies need to understand what intelligence is? And it's simple because it's going to be more important. If you look at the growing complexity of the world, these, these micro actors with, with macro impact, many non-state, you look at the chaos and the uncertainty, what that means is that to make informed decisions, we have to have better intelligence, whether it's in government or even in the private sector. And so what is intelligence? What's the value? And, and Jennifer Sims, Professor Sims and I have talked at length about this, that it, there needs to be a better understanding. And intelligence is a discipline in its own right. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean? And how can we embrace intelligence, not just in the secret culture of the clandestine service, but how can we inform the customers of intelligence? And not just the president, but increasingly many of you who may be at risk. Yeah. And that's why I wrote the book. Terrific. Now, it's been said that history is a set of collisions with the future. Mm -hmm. What are the three big collisions with the future that are being faced by the American intelligence world, let's say, divide it domestically and overseas? Uh, domestically, there are three, and, and it's, it's bigger than intelligence. It really involves all of us, mm -hmm. involves American society and our leaders. And, and I think the three domestically are one, our economy, mm -hmm. for obvious reasons, education, our education uh, system is in a poor state, and, and that really is our most important resources, our, our people, an educated workforce, and uh, the civic responsibility that comes along with that. And, and third, I would say, would be health. A third of Americans are obese. And you can sum that up by how, how can we be a strong nation if, if we're broke and ignorant and fat? Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I would start with that. Uh, in, in, in terms of overseas, uh, I believe that the changing nature of warfare, the changing nature of risk even, uh, we haven't caught up to that reality. Mm -hmm. You've got this growing asymmetry of power, and not just Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, or, or the hacker in cyberspace, 
but it can be very positive too. The next speaker is Bill Gates, a non-state actor, an individual, and look what he has done, how he has contributed. Uh, Zuckerberg with Facebook, and he develops a society of a billion people networked. There are many positive examples if you look at the asymmetry of power. That aspect of it, the role of non-state actors, and increasingly this, this complex, global, integrated battlefield or marketplace. Mm -hmm. So just the nature of war and, and risk. That's number one. We've got to understand that much better, informed by intelligence. Mm -hmm. Secondly, cyberspace. Mm -hmm. uh, my good friend, General Mike Hayden, has talked about the, the coming Pearl Harbor in cyberspace. I agree with him. It's, it's going to happen, and, and we are woefully unprepared. And, and the third um, area I would stress is the, the growing demographic shift worldwide. For the first mm -hmm. time as of last year, more people live in cities. And that trend is accelerating. And if you look at great societies in places like Africa, what does that mean for us in terms of demographics, in terms of resources? I think these changes are going to accelerate, and we need to be better prepared for that ac across the board. So those are sort of three large general chunks that I, I think we should focus on. Let's, let's focus a little tighter for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, you have been quoted as saying that there are very likely as many or more spies working against U.S. interests inside the U.S. as there were during the Cold War, yeah. which um, was a, a, a head-snapping quote when, I, when mm -hmm. I read it. Who are these people, and uh, what are they after? Well, uh, I don't know that. That's my best yeah, guess. guess. I've, I've been out of government for six years, but if you look at the value of intelligence, the importance of intelligence, and then you look at the expenditures and the resources by China, by Russia, by others, mm -hmm. and what for them is one of their biggest concerns? Well, it's, it's the U.S. And not only national security secrets, but increasingly commercial secrets. Uh, much of that which can be gleaned or stolen from, from cyberspace. And it's a, a dire threat, and I think that in part because we've shifted so much of our attention, so much of our resources in the counterterrorism arena, we've forgotten the, the necessity of old-fashioned counterintelligence. And uh, that's an important element of this, a big one. Often, uh, I've heard some people who've been involved in counterintelligence say it tends to be seen as a little bit of the red-headed stepchild in the yeah. intelligence world. Mm -hmm. Why is that when we need it, and what's the cure for it? I think in part because it's something that we don't want to think about. It's very unpleasant to think that our agencies or our businesses have been penetrated by a foreign power or by a criminal organization. Mm -hmm. And we'd rather think about, well, how do we achieve that goal, a foreign policy goal or a profit objective? Uh, that's more fun. That's more positive. And we are a very positive nation. But we can also be a little more disciplined about how we think of protecting our intellectual property and most of all our people. Uh, one of the things that uh, also comes up in the, uh, in the hyper-connected world, world that we are in with digital things is how does the spy that we think of, oh, say, from the 39 Steps or Hitchcock thriller, mm -hmm. now has to go through uh, customs where their pictures are taken. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the operation in Abu Dhabi several years ago when mm -hmm. a Hamas uh, leader was killed. and. Uh, the uh, the perpetrators were seen. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you go off the grid now as uh, as a spy? How do you, how can you go through? That? Yeah, just just asking for a little trade craft. Is that so wrong? <laughs> Again, I would underscore the the discipline. Trade craft is mostly yeah. about discipline and paying attention to detail, whether it's a disguise whether it's the pocket litter mm -hmm. that you have, your cover story, and increasingly your partners. We tend to think of the spy as this unilateral solo hero, and, and there's still some of that, and there always will be. But with a growing interdependence, and I talk about risk, it's increasingly about building alliances and partnerships, trusted partnerships, where you can work with other services and other entities around the world. And uh, that's uh, overall a good thing. Well, you were called by Director John McLaughlin a genuine American hero. He is not a man who is given lightly to that kind of thing. So we thank you for joining us as an American hero. 
and appreciate Field your work. Thank you. Thank you.